Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking all about how to care for syndapsis plants. Now there are a lot of different syndapsis out there, syndapsis being the scientific name. Commonly you will also see these referred to as pothos. Also some people will refer to them as devil's ivy. Also this particular type that has kind of the satiny leaves gets referred to as a satin pothos as well. So just keep in mind that all of those are just other names for syndapsis. Now, like I said, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of different varieties of syndapsis, but the most common ones that you're going to come across are syndapsis pictus, such as this syndapsis pictus exotica that I have here. However, we do also see now at least one variety relatively frequently on the market of syndapsis trubii, and that is the syndapsis trubii moonlight. But in general, when we're talking about syndapsis that we're bringing into our house as houseplants, most of them are either gonna fall into the syndapsis pictus species of plants or the syndapsis trubii species of plants. I want you to remember this because in my personal experience and from what I've heard from most other people, there's a slight difference in difficulty of care between the two and I will address that more as we go along today. But I currently own three types of syndapsis. I did used to own four. I did used to have that Trubii Moonlight. Once again, I will discuss that more as we go along today. But the three that I still have now are all syndapsis pictus cultivars. So I already showed you the syndapsis pictus exotica. This is actually a propagation that we had recently potted up together from my mama plant. My mama plant has gotten quite large as you can see and so she's kind of hard to hold up on screen plus she creates a obstacle for filming because Theo wants to play with her vine so that's why I didn't bring her down from where she's hanging today. Now I do also have what is known as the syndapsis pictus argyreus. So this is very similar to the exotica, except that the leaves are quite smaller, but as you can st see, still gets that silvery variegation on these beautiful velvety green leaves. I do have this one pinned back over itself to help fill the pot in. That's why it doesn't look like it's trailing much right now. If I had all of those unpinned, it would be a little bit longer looking, but I absolutely love this plant. And especially if you just need something that has smaller leaves, but you like that look, because some places like, in your home, like big leaves just don't work. You know what I mean? This is definitely a good alternative for that. Now I do also have a Syndapsis Pictus Silver Splash that one of our lovely subscribers sent to me back in the springtime. Now the new leaves that are coming in on here, as you can see, are quite bright. I do find that on some Syndapsis, they will come in bright and then they'll start to darken off later on. This is one of the original leaves from the cuttings that were sent to me. I think it's the only one that's left. Nope, this might actually be an original one back here as well it is. Now, another thing to note though, you guys, I actually think that these leaves are staying slightly lighter for me because of the current window I have this plant in. So we will be revisiting this guy when we get to the lighting portion of this video. But I do wanna move on to talking about the growth pattern for these plants because a lot of people don't realize that most of us are not growing these plants the most ideal way. We aren't growing these plants even remotely, how these plants would grow in the wild. So let's just address that, shall we? So first of all, these are vining plants. They are native to Southeast Asia. They are epiphytic in nature, so they grow off of the side of trees in the wild. Now in our home, a lot of us like to let them trail, and that is totally okay. However, you do need to be aware that they have a tendency to put out runners. And sometimes these runners can be a sign that the plant's not getting enough light, but just in general, even if they're getting enough light, such as my Syndapsis exotica here, you can see it's put out a lot of runners. So runners are basically just vines where there are no leaves. And sometimes they can get excessively long with no leaves. They may eventually push a leaf out off of those nodes might happen, might not happen, but it's one of the kind of annoying things about these plants. And a lot of you guys have commented on past videos where I complain about the runners, that they're doing it because they want to climb. And you're not wrong, they are climbers, like I said, in the wild. So some people will choose to put them on moss poles. However, that is not actually how they climb in the wild. So like I said, they do climb trees. However, they are a specific type of climbing plant known as a shingle plant. So we've seen shingle plants showing up a lot more in stores lately, such as Monstera dubii or Rifidophora hayi, I think is how it's pronounced. 
And you see these in stores, they're attached to a wooden plank and the leaves are laying flat against the plank and one off of each side growing upwards and it creates a shingling type look. That is actually how syndapsis grow in the wild, as you can see here. They grow with their leaves flat against the trees, the leaves actually attach to the tree in addition to the vine. However, I do not see many people setting them up on wooden planks in their homes. And I don't know if that's just because people don't realize they actually are shingling plants in the wild. So ideally what this plant would love if you did for it was to give it a flat, fairly wide wooden plank that it could lay its leaves flat against. If you do want to use a moss pole, you can do one of the D-shaped moss poles where the front is actually flat. Just make sure it's a relatively wide one because that way it should be able to, you know what, I'm going to take that back, you guys. I'm not sure. It, pro it probably would need to be a wood plank because I... Those D-shaped poles, the fronts of them are actually plastic. I'm not sure how well the structures on the leaves of these plants that actually grab on and to lay flat against the surface would be able to grab onto that. And since they aren't roots, they're like these little kind of hairs on the back of the leaves that attach. It's not like they're gonna be attracted to the damp moss like the roots would. So I could be wrong about this if anybody's managed to get one to shingle on a flat sided D-shaped moss pole, comment below and let me know, but I have a feeling you're really gonna be better off with a flat plank. But if you don't wanna grow them as a shingling plant, you don't have to, you can let them trail, just remember runners are probably going to be an issue. But beyond that, they are relatively fast growers. They're not as fast in my experience as say your epiprimnums or a lot of your hanging trailing smaller leafed philodendrons like your philodendron micans or your brazils, things like that. I find they grow a little bit slower than those, but they're still relatively fast growers. But let's move on to watering next. These plants typically want to dry, I'm gonna say almost all the way out. I find that if you let them dry completely out like you might do with an epiprimnum in between waterings, that you can start to have some issues. And one of the biggest things you will notice on your syndapsis plants and more so on the Pictus varieties, such as the ones that I've been showing you that I own, is that if they get thirsty, their leaves will start to curl in on themselves relatively quickly. It's gonna be more noticeable on the larger leaf varieties like the Exotica, I guess more noticeable more quickly, I should say, than on the smaller leaf varieties, but it will start to happen. And let me show you like an extreme example of a curled leaf. So you can see how curled this leaf has gotten on itself. Now, if it had gotten this curled, there's a reason this looks like this and I will explain that to you here in a bit. But if it had gotten this curled on a mama plant like the one hanging in my kitchen, we would be in severely underwatered mode. But typically you'll just see the very edges start to curl. Let me see if I can find one. That, oh, here's one that's starting to curl on this one. You can see there how this one here has just slightly curled under. That's the kind of thing you'll start to see if it's really getting thirsty. I do find that you can let these plants dry all the way out, but sometimes in addition to that curling, if you let them dry completely out, you will start to get leaves that will start to turn yellow pretty quickly. So that's why I say I think it's best to let it dry almost all the way out and then water it. Like maybe the bottom like 10% of the pot is still damp when you go in to water it. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this video, the trubiaes can be a little bit more difficult. So when you're watering those plants, you really, really need to be careful because they seem to be, for whatever reason, slightly more prone to root rot than the Syndapsis pictus varieties. And that's not to say that these aren't also prone to root rot. They can get rotted relatively easily, but for whatever reason, those trubiaes, it seems to be more susceptible to it than these. So especially on those plants, be careful. I also find from when I owned my Moonlight, Trubii Moonlight, that the leaves are not quite as vocal. They'll curl, but they don't do it quite as quickly. So don't just use that necessarily as your indicator on a Trubii. I also want to say that pots with drainage are very crucial, you guys. I haven't really been mentioning it a lot in care guides, but especially on these plants that are prone to root rot, you need good drainage. So not only in terms of the type of soil you're using, but you need to make sure you have drainage holes in your pots. 
However, speaking of soil, because these are epiphytic plants, I do prefer to put them all into my epiphyte mix. That has done well for me. And as always, if you are not familiar with my soil mixes, I will link the video where I talk about each one and what plants I use it for in the description below for you. But basically you just need a light, airy, well-draining mix that is not gonna keep these plants roots sitting wet for too long, and it's not gonna deprive them of oxygen. But let's move on to light. So. Lighting with these plants is kind of interesting. This is another plant that is frequently marketed as low light, low light tolerant. No, just, just don't do it guys, don't do it. I, will it be okay for a while? Yes, but it gets leggy fast and your runners, I mentioned earlier, runners can happen with no leaves if the plant's not getting enough light. It happens when it's getting enough light already, so you don't wanna make it more likely to happen by having it in too little of light. So I really would not put them in low light situations. I just, and they get leggy very quickly. And just a reminder for anybody who's new to the plant world, when we say leggy, what we mean on especially vining plants is the amount of space between each node starts to get longer. So let me see if I can get this one up here well enough for you guys to see. So let's look here. So you can see where each of the nodes are is where a leaf is coming out. So here's a node. And then here's a node right here that doesn't have a leaf. Here's another node. Here's a node. So you can see the spacing right there between these two nodes is relatively small. And then here where we don't have a leaf, this is another thing that can happen if it's not getting enough light is it will just skip a leaf. And then that makes it look longer between the nodes because we don't have that leaf in there. So that's what we mean. The internodal spacing will get longer and it just makes it look leggy and lanky and not as full and lush. So I really would not encourage you guys to put these in low light situations. In my experience, they actually will though tolerate some fairly high light levels. Once again, the Truby eyes are a little bit more fussy about that. I would definitely just go for bright indirect light on those. They're a little bit finicky, you guys. Direct light is not gonna be your friend with those. You will start to see probably burn style marks before you even see fading of the leaves. So I wanna jump back over to this guy real quick because he's not burned, he's doing fine. He's been pumping out a bunch of new growth, but as you can see, it is very bright. It is not darkening to this darker green as quick as I would expect it to. And that is likely because a few months ago, I relocated this plant into a southeast window in my bedroom. Now that southeast window is kind of catty cornered. It's kind of like almost like a bay style window situation where it's like flat and then a catty cornered window and a catty cornered window. So it is probably getting some residual indirect light from the giant southern facing window next to it. And because it's getting so much light, that is probably why it is looking so much lighter colored than it normally does. I really probably need to relocate it, but it's been growing well for me. Like, like I said, it's been growing more quickly for me than any of my propagations that I've done of like my other syndapsis plants before. So it seems to be liking it. I mean, it's not hurting the plant. The plant is doing fine. But another thing I wanna talk about is the type of variegation that is on these syndapsis pictus plants. So this is what is known as blister variegation. And so basically blister variegation is a mechanism that plants developed to deal with basically too much sunlight. So it's kind of like, I heard somebody refer to it as like sunblock for plants. They like kind of created their own built-in sunblock and it helps all this silver on here helps to ref reflect the light off of the leaf to protect the leaf. I do have a video where I explain the types of variegation and explain this a little bit more in detail for you guys. I will also link that below for you guys. But blister variegation is an indication that these plants at some point in time were living in a place where they were getting enough light that it was potentially a problem and they developed this mechanism to help deal with it. So it is a plant that typically starts off in the understory where it lives underneath trees, but then it climbs up those trees to get to more light. And it must have done a really good job at it to the point where it got so much light, it had to develop this blister variegation. So the fact that it has developed this is indicative of the fact that it should be able to tolerate some brighter light levels than you might think. But as always, just slowly introduce it to the location that you wanna put it in, look for negative signs of things happening that might indicate that it's too bright, any kind of burning of the leaves, if they're getting super bright like this to the point where it almost goes yellow, then 
way too much light, move it back away and just kind of find that sweet spot in your home where it's the happiest. Oh, and also don't forget, the more light you get it, the more quickly it should grow. So if your plant is a fairly established plant, not like a plant that was propagations that you recently potted up and it's not growing at all, odds are you probably need to get it some more light. As usual, you guys, Theo <laughs> is interrupting us right now, so give me one second. Sorry about that, you guys. Theo just had to go into a bathroom timeout with his food and water because he has just been very destructive today in general. But moving on to temperature and humidity. So as usual, temperature range for these plants is gonna be somewhere between probably 60 to 80, 85. So in your homes, typically they are gonna be fine. We just wanna make sure that we don't have a direct draft from an AC vent or a heat vent hitting that plant. Make sure if it's directly in a window that the window is not getting too hot or too cold at various times during the year. If it is, you may need to relocate the plant depending on the season. Now for humidity, in their natural environment, they're probably gonna want somewhere between like 40 to 50% or higher humidity. But honestly, you guys, they've done fine in my home. I mean, I know people who have them and they do fine for them and they live in places where more often than not throughout the year, it's like 20%, 20 percent, 20 something percent humidity in your homes. They really, really don't care about humidity. Now, if you do have higher humidity, you might find that they grow slightly more quickly, but it's not gonna make that drastic of a difference. However, for in particular, the Pictus varieties with the velvety leaves, if you do live somewhere with very high humidity, these leaves do not really like to stay damp for very long. So you will definitely wanna make sure that you have proper airflow going on so that there's not just droplets of water from the humidity just hanging out on these leaves. Fungal issues can happen relatively quickly on these plants. So just make sure you have some kind of house fan, ceiling fan, open a window if there's a good breeze going on, coming in and circulating air around your plants if you do live somewhere with super high humidity. Now, in that regard, I have also heard people say that when you're dusting leaves on these plants that you shouldn't use water. Honestly, I've never had that problem, you guys. Like a damp cloth and wiping these to get dust off, it's not gonna stay wet very long. But if you are worried about it, you could use just a dry cloth or something like that to dust them off. I mean, we can't say that they hate having water on their leaves totally because they get rained on outside. So I'm just saying, I think you're okay dusting with a damp cloth, but just definitely we don't wanna be like misting these plants on a regular basis or anything like that. Now, as far as fertilizing goes on these plants, I fertilize at least once a month with my balanced liquid fertilizer. So a fertilizer that has an NPK of 10, 10, 10 or 20, 20, 20. However, a lot of people have hypothesized that these plants are actually heavier feeders than we think they are. Some people think that if you feed them more frequently, that might help decrease the likelihood or the occurrence of those runners that we've been talking about. I haven't tried it. Other than the fact that in the summertime, usually, I've not been on top of things this year, you guys, but usually in the summertime, I will up my fertilization to approximately once every two weeks. The thing to understand, you guys, when I'm saying once every two weeks, I just, I still don't do back-to-back -back fertilization. So once every two weeks only happens if, if it's a plant that I have to water once a week, if that makes sense. So. What I'm saying is normally once every four weeks, so if I have to water this plant four times in a month, one of those times I will give it fertilizer. If it is summer and I'm having to water this plant four times a month, every other time I will give it fertilizer. If it's a plant where it takes like two weeks to dry out, then it's not going to get fertilized every two weeks in the summer because I want one non-fertilization in between to kind of help flush the plant out. There are things that can build up in the soil over time from fertilizers. And in my experience, having that in between non-fertilizer to flush the plant helps to keep those things under control. I hope that makes sense. But moving on to pests, the pests, we all just love pests. Okay, so most common pests that you're probably likely to experience on these plants, regardless of whether it's the Syndapsis pictus or if it's Syndapsis trubiae or any of the varieties that fall under either of those, is mealybugs first and foremost, because these are relatively thick, succulent-like leaves and mealies love that kind of thing. I've heard from some people that scale can be a big problem on these plants as well. I've never experienced that. 
I personally think that scale, and I've never had scale in my house. Oh, knock on wood, knock on wood. But outside, like for me, scale tends to show up more on thicker vines and stemmed plants than it does on thinner ones. And these are like relatively thin vines. So, but I've heard from you guys that it can be a problem on these plants. Spider mites definitely can be a problem on these plants. However, because these are such like thicker leaves, spider mites are gonna go for your thinner leaf plants first. So unless you just have all thick leaf plants in your house, and this happens to be the thinnest thick leaf plant you have, odds are spider mites probably just gonna choose a different plant. But if you do find pests on your plant, just isolate the plant as usual. Use your preferred pest treatment method, whether that be some sort of spray, beneficial bugs, whatever it may be. And just make sure you're following the steps to repeat that process as often as needed to break the life cycle of the pest and completely eradicate the pest. And just wait until you are sure that those pests are gone before you integrate the plant back in with the rest of your collection. But let's talk about propagating these plants next. Hoy, if you've been here for a while, you know how I feel about these plants when you propagate these plants. Okay, so propagation is pretty straightforward on these plants, just like with any of your other vining plants. You are going to want to locate a node on the plant. You are going to want to cut right below that node, maybe like a, at least a quarter to a half inch below that node, assuming that's not gonna put it too close to the next node. You're then going to have several options to get that node to root. You do not, by the way, have to have a leaf on the node for these plants to root. But in my experience, these plants are notoriously slow for rooting when it comes to propagating. And if you have a leaf attached to the node, I find that it goes a little bit more smoothly and a little bit more quickly. So you can put these directly into water. That is how I prefer to do it. That's how I've always done it, but they take forever <laughs> to root in water. It's not really that bad. Like, I mean, we talked about how long the ZZ plants take to root in that care guide. We're not talking that long. It's just not gonna happen as quickly as for example, your epipremnums when you put those into water. Now you can add an epipremnum cutting to the water with your syndapsis cuttings to help try and get it to root more quickly. That happens you guys because of a certain type of hormone that is released from those epipremnum cuttings when they're rooting in water that tends to trigger root growth in other plants. So that's why lots of times you'll hear us saying, just add a pothos cutting to it. And when we say add a pothos cutting, we mean an epipremnum cutting specifically. Now you can also take your cuttings directly into soil. It is a little bit trickier though. You're running a little bit of a higher risk of rot. You really have to keep the moisture level higher than you would on the normal plant. And a lot of people just find it kind of difficult. That's why I personally prefer to go directly into water. Now, if you are somebody who likes to do prop boxes using sphagnum moss, definitely that will work. You can throw these into that damp moss. Just make sure that the node side where the bump is, where the roots are gonna come from, is actually in contact with the damp moss. If you wanna try doing any other kind of method that involves a prop box, I know some people like to use perlite and things like that. Honestly, I do not have experience with that with these plants, so I can't really speak to that, but I'm sure it could work. Will it work faster or not than water, for example? I can't say, but give it a go. If you have tried it, comment down below and let people know how it's gone for you. But after your plants, if you do have them in water, have developed about two inches worth of roots, you can go ahead and pot them up. But once again, I find they take a while to start to establish themselves and put out new growth. So this is a propagation that I did a long time. I probably did this back in March, you guys. And I, I mean, I think it's pushed out like one new leaf. Another thing to note is that if you do propagate in water or even if you go straight to soil or whatever, lots of times you'll get leaves that will curl up, which is what happened to this one. When that happens frequently, they will not uncurl again. Honestly, if you underwater your plant and get the curling on the leaves that I talked about earlier, if you go too far, the leaves won't uncurl. So just keep that in mind. It's just something that happens with these plants. But this plant is doing fine. I mean, you can see all of the roots growing around in here. They're just slow to fill in and start to push new growth. Once again, just in my experience, this is the most recent one that I potted up. Let's see, this was on August 13th and I can't see roots or anything yet down in the bottom, like they haven't started to grow further down in there. Luckily, I only had that one leaf under here that was curled on this one. So this one looks a lot better than the older one, but they just typically take a lot longer in my experience to take off 
when propagating. But the last thing we have to talk about today is toxicity. And unfortunately these plants are toxic to both humans and pets. So make sure you are keeping them out of paws and hands reach. As always, if part of the plant gets consumed or a lot of the plant gets consumed, just get them to a vet or a doctor as soon as possible and everything should be okay. But I absolutely love Syndapsis plants, you guys. And once again, there are just so many varieties out there. I mean, I can't even, I can't even run through them. There's like variegated varieties, there's dark form varieties, there's just so many varieties and they really are fabulous and rewarding plants. Although I do wish they would not put out all of those runners, especially since I like to have mine trailing, but perhaps I will try one of the propagations on a wooden plank for you and see how it does if I actually allow it to shingle like it likes to do. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful. If so, please be sure to click that like and or subscribe button down below and I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Aloha!